So tonight we are talking about collections or data structures. So a data structure, how you structure your data can affect how you, or will affect how you write your program. It's, understand, it's important to understand how to use the two main forms of data structures in Python to um, enhance the way you program. You can actually reduce the amount of code that you're going to write if you have the appropriate data structure in place. And in fact, when I am feeling clever, uh, in my own code, I will often go back and see if there's a better way to structure my data to reduce the amount of code that I have to maintain. So, and what's also important is, this is the last piece of the puzzle that you're going to need for your game, okay? Um, we don't, the, the game doesn't deal with files and it doesn't deal with objects. It deals with everything we've done up until including data structures. So, Python has two main data structures. You don't have to do anything, you just have them. Uh, one of them is a list and one of them is a dictionary. What are the differences? A list is an ordered collection of information. It is mutable, which means you can change it, and it relies on an index. So a list is just like a string in that it has an index value for every element in the list. A dictionary is unordered. It's also changeable, it's mutable, and it maps keys to values. There is no concept of an index in a dictionary, which is why it is unordered. And that's the newest data structure, and we are going to spend some time on it, and you will need that for your program, as well as a list. So there are some new symbols to look at tonight. There is the square bracket. An open and closed square bracket denotes that you are creating a list, but also that you are getting an element from a list or getting an element from a dictionary. Um, the open and closed squiggly braces or curly braces it is indicative of a dictionary. If you see open and closed uh, squiggly braces, your variable will be of type dictionary. So, lists are ordered and mutable. So what we're going to talk about in this slide and the next slide is CRUD. I introduced this concept in Module 2, and we're, we're going to come back to it because it tells us quickly what we can do to a data structure. A list, you can create it, read it, update it, or delete it. Creating just means making a new one. Read it means you're getting at the data inside the collection. Update, you're modifying an existing list, and delete, you're removing an existing list. So we've got this nice little handy dandy four corner presentation slide. To create, I do just what I said. I have a variable called my list. We know it's a variable because it's on the left-hand side of a single equal sign. On the right-hand side of a single equal sign is an open and closed square bracket, which means I'm creating an empty list because I can create an empty list or I can create a populated list. And you'll notice here that variables work the same way variables always work. It doesn't matter if it's a collection on the right-hand side. It's always got to be a single equal sign. I can also create a list that is populated. And in this case, I just have three elements. I have Lisa, I have the number 42, and the float 3.14. And that is just to demonstrate that a list doesn't have to have the same type of element. In some languages, like Python, sorry, like Java, you very well may be forced to have the same kind of element. In Python, it doesn't care. It's an element. As long as it knows what it is and knows how to, how to figure out what it is, it doesn't care. 
So reading, how do I get at stuff in my list? Well, I do it just like with strings, just like we've seen a couple of times with lists. You use it by get, using that index value. So the index value is my list, and then we're going to have the open and close square bracket. And in the middle of those square brackets, we're going to have the index number that corresponds to the value I want. And in this case, it's just zero, so it would be the word Lisa. And I can also use it in a for loop. If I have a for loop, I can just say for elm in my list. Elm is just a variable that's local to the for loop. And I can just say print elm. And I will, it, Python will just go through that list and it will do whatever I want to to the ele each element in the list. Update. I can change the value at any point in the list. So I want the third variable to be the word pi rather than the third element being of my list being 3.14. So I can simply change it by assigning a, val a new value to it. It's just that easy. I can also add new elements to the end of the list. Let's say I've got more stuff that I want to add. I want to add another number 42. And so I can just use the append function and I can make my list longer because that's what I'm doing when I'm appending it. I'm just adding another element to the end of the list. So I'm making it longer each time. And I can also make it shorter by using the pop function. Pop will remove the first element in the list. And by the way, this is just a very, very, very small amount of what, small number of functions. Uh, I've got a URL down at the bottom here, and it just goes to the Python data structures page and there is so much you can do that Python gives you. We don't have enough time to cover it in this class. I'm just covering the big ones. And I can delete. I can delete in a couple different ways. I can delete an element from the list, which just removes it. It just throws it away. The um, list will become shorter by that, by one element. I can also delete the whole list. So DEL is a keyword and it means delete. So I can delete an element or I can delete the whole list if I want. So let's talk about some list basics. And this is challenge 6.1.1 and it's just say modify short names by deleting the first element and changing the last element to Joe. So I've got a little input, I've got a little script. Professor Lee is going to input something. And in this case, it's going to be a string, and that string is comma, has comma-separated values in it. So I'm going to use the split function which uh, on the input, which I've done many, we've done many times in this class, and I'm going to create a list. So I now want to manipulate that list. How am I going to manipulate it? Well, the first thing it says is deleting the first element. So I said del names of zero, so I'm removing Gertrude, and you will see that my list is now three elements instead of four. And then I'm going to change Anne, so I'm going to change Joseph to Joe. So it's the second, it's the third element of the list, or index two, because we always begin at zero. So my list now changes to Sam, Anne, and Joe. Okay, as I said before, there's a whole lot of list methods out there. There are some notable ones here, and we'll talk about some of these a little later in the class. Count, because you're going to have to use it in a lab. Sort, because you're going to have to use it in a lab. Append, because you're probably going to have to use it in a lab. And reverse, because you're going to have to use it in a lab. So if you have questions about any of the labs, and you're thinking, well, how in the world do I sort this list? Come back to this slide and realize that there's a sort function. Python already does it for you. They will always do it 
uh, more efficiently and better than you can. So use what they give you unless there is a really, really good reason to invent the wheel. And for this class, there isn't a good reason to invent the, reinvent the wheel. Okay. List functions, sort, and reverse. So you want to sort the names in reverse alphabetical order. So I'm going to input Jan, Sam, and Joe, and Todd. I'm going to split it this time by on a space so I get my nice little list of five elements. I'm going to sort it. And sort it is going to put it in a sort order, and Jan, Joe, Sam, and Todd. And I'm going to reverse sort it. And it's going to give me that Todd, Sam, Joe, Ann, and Jan. It's as, it's as simple as that. You will notice that we are using the dot notation with these functions. So the variable names for this to work has to be a type list underneath. So we know names is a list because we have user input dot split. That's what it was. That's what was on the right hand side of the assignment. So it's the variable, the dot, and then the function. So in this case, it it's saying, "Hey Python, sort the list, sort all of the the elements in list names in alphabetical order." That's what net names dot sort does. Names dot reverse says, "Hey Python, reverse alpha sort the name sort the elements in the names list in reverse order." So, write a loop to print all the elements in the hourly temperature. Separate the elements with a an arrow. This is using a for loop to loop over the list. Now, why is that important? to use a for loop to loop over the list because for loops were made for lists. Okay? And I can do it in a couple of different ways. I can do it for L and in list. In this case, I'm using for index. And that is because I don't I, I only want to put that dash greater than sign in between the temperatures. I don't want one at the end. So that's how you, this is how you have to do it if you don't want that symbol at the end. And you might have, um, excuse me, a lab that requires this. So I have a four index in range. So I'm going to be looping through the list, getting it by its index value. So I'm going to print hourly temp of index, whatever index is going to go from zero to four to three, and I want to put a space after it. Now I have to do that, remember, because if I don't have end equal quote space quote or whatever, um, what will happen is that it will do a new line. And I don't want a new line, I want everything on the same line. So now I'm going to check to see if I'm at the last element in the list. The way I do that is I check the index number against the, what would be the index of the last uh, element in the list. So the index, if it is not equal to the length of our hourly temp list minus 1, because remember, we start at 0, we go to, in this case, 3, even though there are four elements, so I'll get four back when I use the len function, but I want it to only, um, but I want it to make sure that I don't do it the fourth time. So then I'm going to print my uh, thing and I'm going to end, and I'm sorry the animation isn't right. So that was for 90. At index 1, I'm at 92. I'm going to do the arrow at index 2. I'm at 94. I'm going to do the arrow. And for index 3, I'm going to put 95. But I am not going to do the arrow 
because 3 is equal to len hours minus 1 because it's going to be 3. Okay, so the in operator is your friend. 4 in is your friend when you're dealing with lists. Okay, here's the really new stuff. Multidimensional lists. So far, we've pretty much dealt with single dimensional lists, except in one of the things in module two. Now, we're going to have lists of lists. And if you want to visualize this, a multidimensional list, a two dimensional list, is a matrix. If you have ever seen a spreadsheet, you have dealt with multidimensional lists. You have dealt with um, a matrix. So you have rows and columns. And the way, uh, the way you denote a multidimensional list is you have outer square brackets and inner square brackets. And you'll notice that the first row, 10, 20, 30, is the first list in the, our, our multidimensional list. And it's denoted just like a normal list. It's just open square bracket, 10, 20, 30. And then I'm going to put a comma in the middle because the list is the first element in my multi-list. And the second element in my multi-list is going to be 40, 50, and 60, the second row of my table, and a comma. And then the third element is going to be 70, 80, and 90. So what I have here is I have outer square brackets, and then I have three individual lists inside those outer square brackets, and then a comma separating the list. So that is how you structure and format a multidimensional list. It is a list of lists. So how do you get to the data? How do you loop over a multidimensional list? You have a single loop for each dimension in your list. So if I have numbers 1, 2, 3, 2, 4, 6, 3, 6, 9, separated by commas. And I, that's what I input. And by the way, there are spaces between those numbers. I'm going to split it. And what I get is I get a flat list with 1, 2, 3, comma, 2, 4, 6, comma, 3, 6, 9. So I then am going to create an empty table. Now I'm going to have two... Uh, um, loops here because I want to be able to um, to print them out by row and column. Sorry, I was just rereading the challenge. So how I how do I do this? I do this with a list within a list. Sorry, a for loop within a for loop. So what I do is I my outer for loop goes, you're basically starting with those outer brackets. And the first thing that I'm going to do is I'm going to, sorry, I had to, had to get my brain right on this problem. We have to do this in two steps. The first step is you're going to create a table, a, a list within a list. So right now, I have a flat list. Um, Numbers separated by spaces. I have three groups of numbers separated by spaces in my rows. Now I want to take those and I want to turn those into individual lists. So that's the first thing I do. So the first thing I do is I'm going to say for row counter in range len rows. Rows is my flat list. And then I'm going to say cells equal row of row counter dot split. So the first thing that I'm going to get for cells is 1, 2, 3. And I apologize, I forgot to put the quotes. And so now 
I'm going to create an, an empty list called row because I want to have each of those individual elements in the row. So I'm going to say for cell counter in range len cells and I'm going to append the cell, turn it into an int, and add it to my row list. So I now am going to attend row to table. So table now is a multi-dimensional list with a single element in the list. So I'm going to do the same thing for rows three and sorry for rows two and three. And this isn't in order. I'm sorry. I'm just going to do this. That's fine, Joshua. Who else do we have? No, nope, just you and me. So let me just make this big. So what I have here is this multidimensional list. Whoops, didn't want to do that. Okay, the multidimensional list starting here and going here, the, these two for loops, these nested for loops, are creating table. Table is a um, multidimensional list. So it will have 1, 2, 3, 2, 4, 6, 3, 6, 9 as the elements in the list. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to print it out with a pipe in between, which is the, um, the, the, oh, my brain. It is the final output for the challenge. So because that slide was not working happily, let's do this, nested list. Okay, so what we don't have here is, which, which one was that? Sorry. This is 651. I have 651 right here. So let's actually walk through this one in the code. So I've got a breakpoint here at table and a breakpoint for line 14, and we see that I have populate a table here and output the table. So there are two different um, for loops. The first major for loop has a nested for loop and the second major for loop has a nested for loop, basically because there are two dimensions in the table. So let's do this. Come on. Where are we? We are here. I'll just six, six, five, one. We're good. Okay. So let's just walk through this. I think walking through the code will be better at this point. So I don't have any frames and variables yet, but what I'm about to do when I step over line five, hold on, where am I? Okay, I'm going to debug. Oh, hold on, something is wrong. Why is it going there first? Console frames and variables. Hold on, I'm just going to put this in. Uh. There we go. Don't know why that was looking like that. Okay. Uh, 
Okay, we're just going to step over and we're going to create table. So I have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine are is my input. And now I have a table called rows of oh shoot, gotta stop. Can't do it that way. All right, let's do it this way again. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Because it was gonna get those quotes. Okay, this is much better. So I'm gonna split it. When I split it, I get this right here. That's my rows. I have a flattened list with one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine with spaces in between. Now I'm going to create something called table. It's just an empty table. It's right here and there's nothing in it. And then I'm going to step over that because what I'm doing here is now I'm saying, I want to loop through the row, I want to loop through my rows table and make it into a multi-dimensional because it's flat right now. So the way I do that is I have an outer for loop for that main, um, sorry, for the, the main rows. And so I'm going to start with the first element. Row counter is zero. Cells is going to be row of row counter dot split. So it's going to get the one, two, and three. So we'll see that the one, two, and three is here. Now I want to make that a list of integer on its own. So I've created an interim. This is interim because it's inside the for loop. It's only going to exist as long as that outer for loop is still running because it's a local variable it's in the local scope of the for loop. So now I want to populate it. So the way I'm going to populate it is I'm going to say for cell counter in range lens cells and then I'm going to append the cell after making it an integer. So we can see down here that I have my cell counter is zero, and I'm going to append my cell to my row. So if I watch row, row now has the number one. It's going to have the number two in it now, and it's going to have the number three. So I've successfully converted the quote one, comma, quote two, comma, quote three into one, two, and three. Now I want to put that information into table so I can use it later because table was defined in line five which is in the global scope so it is outside the local scope of that for loop and I need to do that because I want to use table in the next set of for loops so we're going to now append row to table so if we look at table here right here we will see that table has a single element. That element is a list, one, two, and three. So I'm going to do this again for the second row with four, five, and six. Same thing's going to happen. And when I've gotten to six, I'm now going to append my new row table, the four, five, and six in it, to my table. So table now has two elements which are lists. I'm going to do it one more time. And I'm appending that final row to my table. So now table has three elements. Those three elements are themselves lists. So now I want to print them. So here's what I'm going to do. Here is a new function. That function is called enumerate. What enumerate does on a, on, a, on a flat table is it will give you both the index and the value. So it's a handy dandy little function that I use quite often. What I'm doing is I'm getting both the index and the cell value from the row and then I'm going to decide how to print it. I'm going to print the cell 
a pipe and then an end it with a space or I'm just going to print the cell because I don't want that pipe symbol at the very end. I don't want it to be a trailing one. So let's walk through and see how this works. So I have four row in table. Now this row is not this row. This row only existed in the local scope of this for loop. So as far as Python can, cares about, it really doesn't exist anymore. So I'm going to then uh, step over, step into the for loop, and what do I have in that for loop is, where's my index? Oh, sorry. I stepped into the first for loop. Now I'm going to step in the second for loop because row is one, two, and three. So I now have my first element, which is one, from the first table, the first list in table, sorry. And so I'm going to say is if index is not, not equal to the length of row minus one, then I'm going to print the cell and a pipe. And I'm going to end it with a space and I'm going to go do it again. So now I am at index two and I, so this is the end because remember it's zero, one, and two for the index numbers, and then I'm only going to print cell. Now I'm going to the next row in table. The next row in table is, sorry, there we go. Now I'm going to the next row in table. The next row in table is 4, 5, 6. So I'm going to do the exact same thing. And then now I am at the last row in table. 7, 8, 9, and I'm going to do the exact same thing. So that is how you deal with a multidimensional list. Every dimension in the list has its own for loop. That's just a good rule to remember. Okay, so we're going to talk dictionaries. Dictionaries is the new data structure. And Dictionary is an associative container. That means it has key value pairs. Nothing has an index. There are no indexes in a dictionary. Um, it is an unordered collection because it has no index. So how do you deal with it? Well, dictionaries are very handy. First of all, we know it's a dictionary because it has curly braces around it. That is how to differentiate the, a dictionary in your code. If it has curly braces, then it's a dictionary. If it has square brackets on the definition, then it's a list. So um, you have key value pairs. And a key can be anything, and a value can be anything, including another dictionary, which is interesting because you might need something like that for your game. And we're going to talk a little bit about that. So in this case, I have a variable called my underscore dict. My dict is, I know it's a variable, it's on the left-hand side of a single equal sign. On the right-hand side of a single equal sign, I have this new thing called the dictionary. So the syntax for this is you have a key colon value, comma, the next key colon value. And this can just go on and on and on. In this case, I have a name, colon, Lisa. So my key is name, and my value is Lisa. I have an age, colon, 42. My age is 42. I wish I'm a little older. And I have amount, colon, 3.14. So I have three elements in my dictionary, three name value pairs in my dictionary. The nice thing about the associative uh, nature of a dictionary is you can give your data meaning. There was no meaning in a list. It's just stuff. It is stuff one after the other and you have to somehow imbue meaning to that when you're getting ready to print it out to a user 
or when you're putting it into your database or whatever. A dictionary, you don't have to do that. A dictionary, if it's done in, in a certain way, I want to say a correct way, but I'm not trying to be pedantic, but okay, I'm pedantic. Um, you give the value meaning by its key. So in this case, I have name Lisa. I can assume that a person's name is Lisa. So that is what a dictionary is. And it's really handy, and you're going to have to use it for your game. In fact, you're going to have to use a dictionary of dictionaries for your game. And we'll get to that in a little bit. So I have a key and a value. Name is the key. Lisa is the value. Age is the key. 42 is the value. Amount is the key. 3.14 is the value. That's it. Okay, I can do create, read, update, delete on a dictionary, just like I could on a list. To create it, I can create an empty one with the, an equal sign and the square and the squiggly braces or the sorry the curly braces, and I can create one populated by just having the name val the key value pairs. Don't forget the comma in between the key uh, the key value pairs. I can get data now. Getting data looks a little odd because. You have these curly braces when you create it, but there's no curly braces when you get it. When you are reading elements from your dictionary, you do have to use the square brackets, but in between the square brackets is the key. So key names in dictionaries have to be unique. They just do. So I know that when I get name, I am getting the value associated with name. So that's how you get it. In a dictionary, there's no index, so you use the key to get at the value. I can update it. Let's say I want to change my name to Fred. So I have my underscore dict, open square bracket, colon name, close square bracket equals Fred. I've just changed my name to Fred. I can also add a new value. I can append just like I can append to a list. But since a list is an, a dictionary does not have an index, I have to append the key value pair. So what I do is I use the append function on the dictionary using the dot notation. And in between the parentheses for the append function for a dictionary is the key, whatever that key is. And then what's on the right-hand side of the single equal sign is whatever the value you want. So I do have an append function. It just behaves a bit differently because it's on a different type. The dictionary is a different type than a list. Okay, so I can delete. I can just delete the whole thing if I want. Iterating over a dictionary. So how in the world do I do this? Because for loops are made for lists. So what in the world do I do to iterate over a dictionary? Well, for 6.16.1, actually, let's just do this in PyCharm. Do I have this one? 6.16.1. Oh, I apologize. I don't have this one. So we're going to do it here. Sorry about that. So I'm going to write a loop that prints each country's population in the country pop table. So I have user input. I'm going to input this structure here. And this structure looks very much like a dictionary, but I'm inputting it as a string. So I have C136, I124, US318, and O252. So what I'm going to have to do with this is I'm going to have to convert it into a dictionary the first thing I'm going to have to do. So I'm going to split it by commas because that's how I'm going to get a list out of this that makes any sense. And then I'm going to define an empty dictionary called country underscore pop. 
now I have to fill out country underscore pop. So what in the world do I do? Well, I can use an in, a for loop with an in against entries. And what I get is, because it's a list, country, sorry, entries is a list, so I can use an in. And when I get pair, I'm going to get C colon 136 or I colon 124 and so on. So what am I going to do? I'm going to split that pair by a colon because that's what I can split it on. So what I'm going to get is I'm going to get another list with C and 136 in it. So now I want to populate country pop. So the way I do that is I say country pop, open square bracket, close and inside the square brackets are split underscore pair of zero equals split pair underscore pair of one. So I have used the ability to update a list to add C and 136. So that's what it's going to look like. Country pop is now going to be C colon 136. And when I do this again, I'm going to have I-124. So country pop is now changing. I'm going to have US-318. So country pop changes again. And then finally, I'm going to have O-252. And country pop changes again. So now what do I have to do? I need to print each country's and populations. So the way to do that is I'm now going to have another for loop. So my for loop is for country comma pop in country pop dot items. Now items is a new function. It is specifically used for dictionary. Use the dot notation so it would be dictionary dot get me the items Python. And the items are the key and the value. So you will notice to the left of the word in, I have country comma pop. So I have two variables that are going to be local to the scope of the for loop. That's what item does. So I can simply print country has pop people because items returns the key and the value, in this case country and pop. So, and if you guys want to see that run, I can copy that into, uh, or type it up real quick, in um, PyCharm, and then put it up with the um, description. So, a dictionary of dictionaries. You are going to have to use the nested dictionaries for your game. This is how you are going to maintain how you get from one room to another. For instance, I have a dictionary called Rooms. Rooms is a multi-dimensional dictionary because Oh, did you leave Joshua? Wow, if there's only me there, I'm probably not going to finish. Hmm. Well, tonight's will be cut short because there's nobody here. Oh, there you go. I almost stopped it, Joshua. So you're going to have to create a multidimensional list, which starts like this. My apologies. Or sorry, a multidimensional dictionary. So you're going to have a dictionary of dictionaries. You're in an airplane hangar? I'm so sorry. Are you in the are you in the Air Force, Joshua? If you are, thank you for your service. And if you're not, you're a brave man to be in an airplane hangar doing schoolwork. So this is a dictionary of dictionaries, and this is what you're going to need for your rooms. And the way this works is you're going to have the name of the room for your room dictionary. And then you're going to have a direction 
and the room that that direction takes you. So when you have your map, if you have main entry, and then from the main entry, if you've got an arrow that says south, and you end up in the garden, then that would be south garden. It would be main entry, south garden. And when you move between rooms, I'll keep going for Joshua. When you move between rooms, you will find this room, use this direction to get to the next room. That is how that works. That's how that, that, dic that uh, dictionary of dictionaries will work in your game. So for move between rooms, here is just an example. Now this isn't by any means your whole game but it definitely will, should get you started. So I have a multi-dimensional dictionary. And again, i sorry, I forgot that. That's been there forever. OK, I have a dictionary of dictionaries. I have three rooms in my game. I have room one, room two, room three. If I go south, I get to room two. From room one, if I go south, I get to room two. If I go north, I get to room three. From room two, if I go north, I get to room one. From room three, if I go south, I get to room one because I have a very boring game. So you need a place to start. And so we're going to start in room one. If in your game the main entry is the place to start, that's where the current room is going to be. Now that current room setting happens before your while loop because what you're going to have is you're going to have a big while loop. So that current room is set at the beginning of your game after you have defined the dictionary. And then what you're going to do is you're going to ask the user to enter a direction. And the direction can be north, south, east, or west for your game. In my game, it can be north, north, or south. And you're going to have to check the validity. If you're listening to this and you're in my class, I might just, just type in A, B, C, D, E as a direction to see what your game, your program does. Does it blow up? Does it tell me I didn't make the right move and I need to, you know, type in one of four moves? Um, so you don't want it to blow up. So, and what I say is if di direction is not in current rooms dot keys. Okay, this is really good because what it does is it gives me a list of the keys. So for room one, it would give me a list with south and north in it. And I can then just use the in operator and it will say A, B, C, D, E is not in south or north. Or it will say south is in south and north. And then it will go to the else. And then I will say current room equal current room direction. So what this does is it takes this current room variable and, oh my goodness, Lisa, I didn't realize how many errors I had because I didn't run this through PyCharm. My apologies. Okay, that's better. So if I'm in current room, then I want to go to rooms of direction, maybe it's south, maybe it's north, and set current room to the rooms, the direction. So if it's south, my new current room would be room two. If it's north, my new current room would be room three. So this is basically how you move between rooms in your game. Now, in your game, this is going to be a very, very big while loop. And we actually have an example of that. So let's do that. Uh, Okay, so here is um, just how to iterate over a dictionary. So this, again, this is not your game, but this is kind of a starting place for your game. Um, what's this one? Okay, here we go. This is the example I wanted to show you for your game, and this script is up on the YouTube site. 
So what I have is I have a great hall, a bedroom, and a cellar. That's what I have in my game. And from the great hall, if I go south, I end up in the bedroom. If, I, if I'm in the bedroom and I go north, I end up in the great hall. If I go east, I end up in the cellar. From the cellar, if I go west, I end up in the bedroom. Small game, but... And then I have the allowed directions. Because I'm probably going to want to check everything. So my current room is great hall. Again, I set that in the beginning. That's where that's the starting place. And I say my exit room is the cellar because I have to tell it where where do I stop. And then my sentinel value is go and my uh, sorry, my test variable is my sentinel value is go and if I type in the word quit, I want to stop the game. It's another thing you're going to need for your game. You're going to need to give the user an out. So, so I have direction equal input. Please input one of north, south, east, or west. If the direction is not in my direct list, then I say um, if it's quit, then I break. Otherwise, I tell you you have an invalid entry. And now I'm going to move to rooms of current room. So I'm going to change where I'm at. And then I'm going to see if the direction is not in keys. And then I'm going to move. And then when I finish, I'm going to say game over. So let's run through this just a little bit. This is example dictionary. Example dictionary. Okay, so I've just got my debug thing down here on the Sentinel. So let's just run it through the debugger for a second. Right now, I don't know why it has these table index and rows not defined here. I do not know what's going on. I'm going to try and get rid of that. Remove all watches. Okay, that did it. Don't know why there was a watch on there. Okay, so... I am not debugging. Boy, I can't control this thing tonight. All right. So now I'm debugging. What do I have defined? I have my current room, which is the great room, the great hall. I have four directions available. I have my exit room as the cellar. And I have my rooms. I have great hall. I have bedroom. And I have cellar. So let's step over this real quick. And my sentinel is not quit, so I'm going to step over. Hmm. Direction equal input. Please enter one of north, south, east, west, or quit. So it's waiting for me to enter a direction. And I'm going to cheat a little bit. I'm going to come up and I'm going to enter south. So I enter south. So if direction is not indirect, but it is, so I say move to equals rooms of current room. So my move to is now south and bedroom. What it is, is it is the dictionary that I want to use. So I have rooms of current room, and I get that by just getting from the great hall. So I have rooms of current room. That's what I've got right here. That's what it gives me back. So now I can just use that, and I can say if direction is not in move to dot keys. Well, the dot keys will give me south, so I'm going to step over that, so I know that the direction is in my dictionary. So now I'm going to actually move the room. This is the line where you move rooms. You are setting that current room to the new room. So I'm going to step over, and now you will see that where is my current, current room is now bedroom. So I just moved to the bedroom. And then it's going to print, you are in and then is 
the current room the exit room? Nope. So I can do it again. I'm in the bedroom. If I want to go to the cellar and end the game, I'm just going to step over. I'm going to print, what is that? East. I'm going to step over. My new dictionary that I'm looking at has north and east. North Great Hall, east is cellar. I'm going to check. It is. My current room is now the cellar, so I can successfully check the current room. The current room is my exit room. The game is over, and I'm done. So that is a skeleton for your game. Thanks, Joshua. I kept going after I realized you were going in and out. So don't worry about it. So this is example dictionary, and it will be, it, it is part of the description for this YouTube video. So let us go over the labs. And then, Jacob, if you have, er, Joshua, sorry, if you have any questions, please let me know. So a varied amount of input data pseudocode. So this is lab 6.12. So I'm going to get in some values. I'm going to split those values. I want to convert my string to integers. So I'm going to do that. And then I want to get the average and the sum. So it's really nice because there are functions for average, or there are functions for sum for a list. and the way you get the average is you just take the sum of everything in the list and divide it by the length of the data. And then for max, there's also a function. You don't have to roll through a list and add anything up. There is a max function. And then you're just going to put the out output, the average, and the max. 6.12 is on a single dimensional list. It's the, the flat list that we've all been working with. So. We now have filter and sort list. So I'm going to get some input values. I'm going to split it. I'm then going to take it. And um, what I want to do is I want to create a list of everything that's non-zero. So if token in tokens, and tokens is just what's passed in, is greater than zero, this indicates that you might have to change it to an integer, then append the token to the input data. So that's using the append function on the input data list. Then I'm going to sort it, and then I'm going to print it out. So that's where you use the sort function. And the output is just a for loop over the list. and um, in this case, you have to make sure that it is space separated. And so you make sure, just like we did it those two times, where we made sure we checked that it was not the last element before we used the print, the print with the end. Same thing you got to do here. OK, word frequencies. So basically, we're going to input a list and set the user sentence. Sorry, we're going to input a value, and we're going to split the user input at, to user sentence. And then basically, they give you a sentence. So you have to run through the list. Um, and then all you do is say user set, output user sentence index and the count of. So here's you want to use the count function, because oh, that's what they're doing. They're putting in like the letter A, and then, um, yeah, I think they're putting in the letter A, and then you have to see how many times A is in the list. I have to go back and look. So those are the um, three labs that you will have to do this week. So Joshua. Are you still there? Yeah. Do you have any questions? Is there anything you want me to go over?
going once. Okay, you have a wonderful evening, and I will have this up tomorrow. And I hope that this wasn't, you know, too much in the airplane hanger. Good night. Thank you.